Okay, hello everyone. My name is Jonas Edman, and I'm an instructional designer at the Stanford Program on International and Cross-Cultural Education, or SPICE. And together with uh, Gary Mukai, uh, we have had the deep, deep pleasure of working with these fantastic fellows um, this year. And it's been such a fun experience. And although most of our meetings have been on Zoom, uh, when we met here, it, it felt like we'd been hanging out in person uh, and like we know each other so well. Um, so I'm so excited uh, that the fellows get to present their, uh, their, pro their amazing projects for this year. Um, you'll see that we'll have, we'll have three presentations and then we'll have 15, 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, and then we'll have uh, another three uh, presentations and then uh, 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, which brings us up to, uh, let's see, 12.30. Uh, so we're gonna push back the lunch, I apologize for this, uh, to 12.45. Um, so I hope you guys uh, have eaten something today uh, already. <laughs> Okay, so um, without further ado, um, I will ask our first fellow to come up, uh, Mark Rasson, um, who's going to be talking about his project on uh, the Bering Sea. So, welcome, Mark. Good morning, class. It is so great to see smiling faces here instead of blank Zoom screens. Today we're here to globalize our education community college. Oops. They said this was going to be uh, easy. Globalizing community college curricula. Uh, we have a great collection of different fields here, a vast array, and our, our, our projects will show the interdependence, I hope, to show the interdependence of our different curricula because it's crucial for students at this time to understand the interrelationship of geopolitics, global studies, ecology, biology, and human behavior psychology. For at no other time uh, in history are these critical factors uh, coming into force uh, that will fundamentally change uh, our future and the future of Mother Earth. Uh, truly, we are at an epic moment in the future of our planet. We've taken a look at the uh, far north. We go to the far north of the high Arctic. No place on Earth is changing as fast as the Arctic in terms of uh, accumulated heat. As written this by this photograph, this is a typhoon in the Bering Sea. For the first time in history, last September, a typhoon made it up there. So we're looking at a case study of a, uh, a, a heating Arctic as well as a crisis of a heating up with uh, our nearest neighbor, well not nearest neighbor, but our neighbor Russia. <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Breaking up in the Bering Sea is what we call our project today, <clears throat> and I'm working with an Alaska native, Delbert Pangawi, who's uh, of this region. Uh, we have produced four teaching modules uh, for students to look at. One, history and geopolitics. Two, energy and economics. Three, uh, ice ecology. And four, the psychology of trauma. <laughs> my Yupik given name is Iyanga, and my English given name is Delbert Pangawi. I am from Sibukok Island, the original name for our island, uh, better known in the world today as uh, St. Lawrence Island, Sibunga, Alaska, originally pronounced Sibungok. So the legend of our island is from the back when the last ice age uh, melted and the land bridge between Russia and Alaska went under the water, that the legend is that the creator reached down under the ocean to the ocean floor and pulled it out and wrung it and and put it there from an aerial view it looks like a sponge thousands of lakes so this is what he's talking about climate change has always been an issue for this region because the uh, 10 20 thousand years ago it was above the ocean the bering land bridge is where he lives at uh, sobunga uh, Alaska, and this was the opening for the marriage of Asia and the Americas. And so the animals and the people that hunted them followed the land bridge over and populated North America from the tip of Alaska down to the tip of Tierra del Fuego. So his 
clansmen, Siberian Yupiks, are still living in this area and have been at least for the last 5,000 years, possibly back to 20,000 years. And they are a marine hunting uh, people and they're decked here in uh, seabird parkas and uh, walrus and uh, walrus skin boots and uh, seal leggings. Uh, and this picture is Delbert's daughter walking on the ancestral trail of the land bridge facing Russia and facing a uncertain future. During uh, this period, the, the Cold War has reinstituted itself. During the last two years, actually, the, a new Cold War, an Iron Curtain has fallen. This is 180 degrees where West meets East. This is the international date line, the international borderline, and the boundary between today and tomorrow. And the visiting back and forth with our clansmen, our, our Yupik family members across Russia, we speak the same language. And we have Pangawis, Pangawis up there. We got the Bualamis over there, the clans over there. And so when the Cold War era uh, erupted, it's what the world calls it, the Iron Curtain came down, boom. The visiting closed. For over four decades, there was no visiting. And finally, um, Russia okayed and opened uh, visiting again, visitation again. They had Bering Air flights that go over there and get several plane roads to come and, and visit with, in Gamble and Savonga. How my grandfather was so, grandmother was touching. She just had to smell, smell them, kiss them and love them to, at her elderly age, you know, that they finally got to see each other again and love each other again. And they all, all crying and smell, kissing and smelling each other on their necks. Oh, that, that was very, excuse me, powerfully, emotionally moving uh, reunion. So, this project that we're doing is done in ArcGIS, and if I had a computer access, I could click on one of these uh, buttons and that would pop up and you'd get details on that. But uh, I think uh, these are, uh, during our epic symposium, at least 12 incidents of uh, border skirmishes or, or positions uh, of challenge in the border. One of those you may have heard about, and that was uh, Siberian Yupiks who were going to be conscripted into Putin's war got in a boat and took a 300 mile trip and looked for asylum in uh, St. Lawrence Island and that made it into the news you may have heard about that but probably what you didn't hear about were the other activities that I just found out on the web these are missile launching tests of Russia on the Ch uh, Chukotka Peninsula these are Russian submarines uh, popping up along the border uh, number one is where uh, the, the uh, conscripted folks sought asylum number two is a new uh, a reinstituted Air Force base on Delbert's Island, which Delbert is saying, thank you, you're putting a bullseye on our island again. Uh, number eight is a very worrisome uh, ocean convoy of Chinese and Russian ships having war games in American territories found by the U.S. Coast Guard. And number nine is a famous Chinese spy balloon that was intercepted at, uh, coming over the pole and at, uh, finally in South Carolina. I wish to also say that Vladivostok, Russia is the nuclear fleet for the Soviet, or the Soviet, huh, yeah. Russian fleet, uh, deep water port just down the street from Pyongyang, which has been shooting off rockets like it's the 4th of July. So we move on to energy and energy economics. The melting ice has allowed uh, icebreakers, and Russia has, this is the mother of all icebreakers. This is a 400-foot atomic-powered icebreaker that can crush nine foot of ice uh, going at three knots, keeping the ice lanes open. Why? So uh, Russia can begin to and continue to export its liquid natural gas, and that is uh, this demonstration here. Uh, 
in conjunction with China, which has articulated the new Silk Routes. Remember the old Silk Route, Marco Polo, going from Europe to Asia? This is the new Silk Route going from Asia to Europe across the pole. That X is 90 degrees north, the North Pole. And there's several proposed Silk Routes uh, to export gas, usually coming from the Yamal Peninsula, where the liquid natural gas is flowing, and it's all flowing through the Bering Strait. Remember, it's only 50 miles, but half of that is American 50 miles, so it's a 20-mile strait of which all these heavy-duty uh, ships are having to go through. So the new Straits of Hormuz for the next generation. There is a new comprehensive strategy, uh, no limits between these two nations, China, and Russia, and when you turn the Asia on its side and look at it from a different perspective, you can see the dominance of here, China, um, Russia, with a few pesky democratic countries in the way for them to dominate the North Pacific. So uh, look at the far end there, that's the Bering Sea, where I'm talking about, and its conjunction on the flip side is the South China Sea, which obviously is in great uh, contest these days. So the, the reason this is an issue is that because the mother ice, as Delbert calls it, is melting. The ice age is over. This is a proof positive in, tw in the last 10 years. This is the extent of the ice. And since 2013, the white extends well down about to 56 degrees north. And in 2018, this is also what it was like uh, two weeks ago at the extent of the last uh, winter ice. In 2018, uh, you can see the ice is, is poor, and he calls it sad ice. Why sad? Because the Yupik depend on ice as a platform for them to get access to the marine mammals, whales, seals, seabirds, and, uh, and walrus, and without that, they face a food insecurity, and the ships going back and forth in the darkness of the Arctic night, possibly spilling oil, having a nuclear accident, general trash, and, and, and flashing lights potentially disrupts migration uh, patterns. This is an uh, ec ecological slide uh, of the last century. At the top, the extent of the ice allowed a hold fast for algae and a lot of marine creatures, marine obligate animals such as walrus and seal. Now the 21st century, the ice has retreated. And what is missing here is a cold pool of water that forms at the bottom of the ocean when the salt water freezes, you know, Salt water doesn't freeze, only fresh water freezes. The salt falls to the bottom and forms a thermal curtain. That th th thermal curtain is now gone, allowing fish to move north from the southern to the northern Bering Sea. Look at 2010, only 20,000 metric tons were caught, and now a million metric tons are caught just in a few years as these fish move north. Well, that may be good for fishermen, but it's not good for the ecology because these giant predators are bringing their appetites and eating the food chain from the bottom up. That brings us to how you feel about this. How do we feel about this? What is the psychology of trauma? What has gone on with Delbert and his people since the last 5,000 years, the last 300 years? This is a, 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 a symbolic photo of a culturalization. And what are people wearing there? Uniforms. So this is the uniformity of a culture where their language is forbidden, their cultural practices are forbidden, um, practicing uh, any of their uh, re relationships with their shaman is forbidden. And these are the survivors who are in the schools. You're not seeing about the people who did not survive uh, cultural genocide, disease, alcoholism, uh, etc. And this is not just for the Yupik people, it's for all indigenous people, as Delbert will remind us. This is everybody of all losing their country, their lands. And uh, how do we begin to address this? You've obviously heard of the Japanese American repatriation, uh, I'm not, redress for um, relocation into uh, camps. There was also an unknown process where Alaskan natives from the Aleutians were also taken from the Aleutians, actually you know, out of harm's way during the invasion of the Japanese, and put into camps. 10% of them died because they were unsanitary. And in reparations, they received $5,000, those who were still alive in, 18, in 1980. Uh, $20,000 went to the survivors uh, of, of Japan. And finally, how does Delbert cope with this survival? And the idea is that he's found a way uh, to get his mind around the, what happened to him. In his actual village, half the people died of starvation in 19, uh, 1879, 1880. 
uh, due to overhunting by walrus by New England whalers, uh, the introduction of disease, alcohol, and his culture was basically shattered. How did he learn to forget and but uh, forgive but not forget? Because he had to so he could go forward as a human being and not be poisoned by resentment. And so he learned how to do this through this uh, book by Howard Napoleon. And it asks me, I was thinking, well, how do we learn to understand climate change? How do we learn to forget? How do we, not forget, but how do we learn to cope and forgive what's going on uh, around the war in Ukraine or even the loss of our climate? How do we process that? I don't have the answer to that. Our next pre presenter, Dr. Amy Corrin, may begin to address that for us. Uh, for now, I just want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank the EPIC EPIC team, and also just to give cred to anyone who else has supported me along the way. Thank you very much. All right, bear with me a second. We have to switch gears for a moment. Okay. Well, oh, great. It's working. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Amy Corrin, and today we're going to go beyond weird, uh, reconceptualizing the introduction to psychology course. And uh, I will speak a little bit to what my colleague Mark um, recently mentioned, you know, how do we cope with some of these new things that are coming into our consciousness, our consciousness as human beings kind of transcending borders. Um, but, you know, first I want to talk about how psychology is weird. Um, it's weird. And what do I mean by weird? Well, when I talk about psych being weird, I'm talking about psychology being Western, being educated, being industrialized, being rich, and being democratic. And really what I'm getting to there is the fact that for most of psych's history, for most of the research history, we have focused on a very small population. What do we focus on? People from weird countries, countries such as America, Germany, the UK, etc. And what's really interesting is people from weird countries comprise about 12% of the world's population. That's it, 12%. And yet, 96% of psychological study research subjects come from that 12% population. So what we're teaching as human nature has actually come from a very small, specific, and relatively culturally homogenous population. Fortunately, psych has started to go beyond weird. At least from the research perspective, there has been this acknowledgement of where our samples have traditionally been coming from, mostly US college students, and there's kind of this internationalization of psychology that started to occur, specifically in research through many collaborative efforts. This is, you know, no one person is an island. So we see the Psychological Science Accelerator, the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science, the Institute for the Globally Distributed Open Research and Education, and also the Monk Pregoshala Research Institution, all of which are starting to look at some of our fundamental concepts and ask, is this human behavior or is this a cultural behavior? Um, so for example, they're starting to look at some of the child development literature um, and look at it in other types of cultures, other types of geographical settings. So you have a child here who's participating in a social learning experiment, and this is a small subset of the larger San community in Africa. But what I wanted to focus on for my project was looking at an increased awareness of the importance of kind of creating this internationalized or global perspective for students. And this is supported by the current and even the most recent past APA goals, the American Psychological Association, which states having a global perspective is becoming a vital characteristic of informed citizens, productive employees, and members of diverse communities. And my colleague Fran is going to talk a little bit more about this idea of creating you know, the global citizen. Um, but nevertheless, most traditional pedagogical resources for psychology 
um, and of course materials for most introduction to psychology, the very first and only course many of my students will take in psychology, continues to lag behind. And what do I mean by that? Well, the following photos all represent what's been considered the best and brightest in the history of psychology. These are taken directly from their open source <laughs> textbook. So we have Wilhelm Wundt, Germany, founding father of psychology. We have William James, the modern founding father of psychology in the US. Most of us should know who this is. We have Mr. Freud, uh, or Dr. Freud as it is. And of course we have the big behaviorists, Pavlov, Watson, and Skinner. Now this is interesting because as our classrooms are looking like this, I'm saying learn our discipline history that looks like this. <laughs> and I wanted to change this. It was an epic undertaking. We're gonna use that word <laughs> every presentation. <laughs> but it really was an epic undertaking. I decided that I was going to reconceptualize the entire introduction to psychology curriculum for my project. And that's exactly what I have begun to do over this past year. So this is really about internationalizing the id, all right, in, in my little nod to Freud. Um, it's, the APA, as I mentioned, is pushing this idea that, you know, we have to look globally. We have to internationalize the idea of human behavior. Um, and, you know, in 2023, this is coming out of February 1st, so right at the beginning of the year, the theme, if you will, for the APA is the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, okay? That, that really, we are, we are bigger than just ourselves and really getting to this idea of internationalization. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. So how did I go about doing this? I internationalized or am attempting to internationalize the introduction to site curriculum through presentation of other worldviews, which I will demonstrate here in a second, introduction of different cultural frameworks, exposure to non-weird research, um, as well as the inclusion of something I'm calling emerging concepts, and I'll get to that in a second. So what did I do? Module creation, that is the name of the game these days, but in particular, I was going to write an open educational resource text within my modules. 12 modules, because that's how many there are in my current introductory class, covering the major concepts in psychology. I am not finished with all of these, obviously. Um, but they're designed with principles of internationalization in mind. They are devoted to specific concepts, including these emerging concepts, which I'll get to. And furthermore, the assessments themselves within an individual module happen designed to incorporate cultural awareness, self-awareness. Later on today, we'll hear from Alison Tripp, who's going to talk about storytelling and the importance of storytelling and how that really brings us a sense of community and, again, the world larger than ourselves. And that's exactly what my students are going to try to do through the assessments that will be given in these modules. Um, to give you kind of an idea of what they would look like, so I'm just going to start with the historical perspectives up here. This is what the reinvented module may look like. What is psychology? Psychology is weird. You know, they, understanding where we're coming from. And instead of just that very specific Western perspective that they have traditionally been given, now they're going to get Eastern perspectives indigenous perspectives, and this is what it might look like. So each of these is a tab. Here we have the Far East, starting with the history of psychology in China, moving to the Middle East and Islam, to India, to Buddhism, to other perspectives. Okay, same thing. I obviously cannot highlight every group in the world with its own traditions and cultural understandings, but I'm trying to hit the big ones to give them that important internationalized perspective beyond the laboratories of Germany and the United States. Now, one thing I wanted to do was not just stay in the past. We need to look to the present and what's going on there. And this is where I have these emerging psychological concepts. These are concepts that transcend borders. These are concepts that are affecting us all. And they're affecting us physically, culturally, economically, and psychologically. 
So what are we talking about? Well, human behavior at the end of the day is at the heart of many of the biggest issues with which we grapple. Climate change, the future of work, AI, health and well-being, that's human behavior. That's what's at the heart of that. These modules have been designed to highlight these human behaviors, these concepts that have a global impact. And this is just to give you an example. I put them together so that we could see them. We have psychology and climate change, loneliness, which is becoming an increasingly large issue across the world. And of course, this idea of reworking work. What will work look like in 100 years? Everywhere, as climate change changes industries, as tech changes industries, what will it look like? So just to give you a little bit of an idea of what I've been working on, uh, in these emerging concepts, this is an example of what the psychology and climate change module looks like. They're introduced to the concept here. And then there's sort of some major subsections under that particular area. So climate trauma, as it's known, ecological grief, which I'll get to in a second, and something known as sol uh, solastalgia. So here's the eco grief section defining it, this idea of kind of a homesickness, a nostalgia for your home where you're still living, but it's no longer what it was. It's like you wake up one day and the house that you've always lived in is now a boat. It's something that's different. You're still there, you're still in the same geographical location, but it's different. So needless to say, I have three different ideas um, within this, the introduction to the topic, eco grief around the world, and then something that I've been working on with Mark is to do something called stories of us, not just for this module, but for all of these modules to really bring home the individual perspective. And what we'll be talking about is stories of eco grief in the Yupik community, which again, Mark just spoke about. So they'll be introduced, who are the Yupik? How is this particular concept affecting that group? And they'll learn a little, a little something about that as well as the psychological concept. So again, this is a collaborative effort. This is not something that I can do on my own and I have been working on this climate change and eco grief idea with Mark and I'm so appreciative of that. Um, Fran Farazahi, who's coming up next, and I have been working with this idea of creating a global mindset, just as we're, uh, she is creating global citizens. You know, what's the mindset that comes along with that? You know, and as far as it goes, what's next? You know, who else can I collaborate with to bring a different perspective, a different mindset, a mental change, a reconceptualization of psychology um, to my students? So I just wanted to say thank you in particular to our mentors, Jonas and Gary, but more to my cohort. Um, I couldn't have done it without them. So thank you and going beyond weird. <laughs> Okay, there you go. Yay. And then it's, it's right there. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Good morning. So, good morning. <laughs> oh, that's okay. All right. Uh, yeah, well, first and foremost, I would like to thank Stanford University and the EPIC team for making this journey so inspiring, collaborative, and informative for all the fellows. Thank you for hosting and thank you for attending uh, this symposium. The title of my talk today is the, An Expanded Boundary of Care, Global Citizenship in the Modern World. As an educator, I understand the uncertainty many young people feel about the future, given, challenges, uh, given the challenges that our world faces. Concern about conflict, destructions, and inequities make the future seem unpredictable and dark. While acknowledging these concerns is important, we can make a positive impact by taking the right action and help to build the future we want to see. 
To do so, we must teach ourselves to expand our boundary of care so that our actions can bring positive transformation. Instead of tuning out, we must counteract defeatism by engaging in courses like global citizenship, which encourages individuals to become responsible global citizens and take action towards positive change. So as you can tell, I've been busy. <laughs> Uh, my major pro my, my project uh, was about creating a course in global citizenship with five modules and also championing global citizenship at our college. I decided to tackle it from different, many different angles. As a friend of mine always uh, points out that the uh, big things are always the symphony of small things. So here we go. So I, for the beginning, you know, after, uh, establishing a five-module uh, uh, course in global leadership and citizenship, brought a lot of uh, ideas into the global studies, which has been established, but it wasn't yet um, uh, really needed some, somebody to breathe life into it. Um, for this first time, I established a global citizenship award at Golden West College, and I'll explain. I also brought global matters to different disciplines, notably our um, uh, arts uh, uh, discipline and also the English uh, department. They took a lot of interest in bringing, bringing uh, globalization to their discipline. I also uh, led a global lecture series um, beginning with the rise of autocracy and uh, around the world and the importance of civil resistance, uh, nonviolent civil resistance uh, in uh, uh, championing democracies. Um, I all, uh, and another lecture series was on the refugees, actually the scholars living in exile. Um, another uh, uh, thing that I created was creating visuals around the campus. But also our library took a huge interest into creating a module for so, uh, the sustainable development goals to become the source of uh, um, uh, research for many dis different disciplines. I also led a week-long awareness week uh, of global uh, awareness uh, on our campus uh, that, uh, showing documentaries about particularly um, climate change, but also championing about environmental issues and a celebration of Earth Day. And the last thing I did was creating a podcast interviewing um, global leaders, which is actually the most fun things I did. So uh, about what is global citizenship? A global citizen is someone who has self-awareness and knowledge of the world and all its inhabitants and has the mindset to constantly take an active role in creating more just, inclusive, and sustainable world. So the modules were basically uh, knowledge, skills, knowledge and the skills based on intellectual skills, social skills, communication skills, action taking skills, values, attitudes, and the capacity of taking action. It was the actually bringing awareness to intersectionality of human rights, economic rights, and, and environmental rights. For that, we uh, kind of like looked at the very first thing. So, so uh, we started asking uh, some fundamental questions that re with regard to those three areas. Um, with the students, we started reflecting on these questions. Like, do we have fair access to healthy food, clean water, shelter, and safety? Do we have access to health care? Do we have access to education, information, and opportunities? Do we have civil and political rights? Do we have the rights to freedom and peace? Do we have equality in, in our societies? Do we have gender equity? Do we have the right to pursue our goals? Are we safe from environmental disasters and destructions? How is our natural environment treated? And do, do our environment and resources, they have rights? For those questions, we started like looking into the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that actually hits all those areas. Students actually learn for skill-wise intellectual skills to do research, to uh, reflect and, and, and uh, to, do to do research and also evaluate information. To be able to, this is, our world is complex. 
our world is things are ambiguous. And the worst thing we can do is to f expect that we can have easy answer to complex questions. And with this, we actually went into like our intellectual capacities to be able to work across like difficult conversations, to be able to look at these numbers, make sense, measure them, and bring our values to them. Um, we also took for our, uh, for our attitude, um, we took an, a journey inside. We kind of looked at how do we look at the, the crises. Perhaps actually we are the part, part of the problem as we go to uh, uh, solve things. The way we see things, the way we frame crises, the, the way we respond to, to our problems, it's usually what? They separated, non-relational, or deficient. The way we frame them are usually problematic, burdensome, and unsolvable. And the way we respond to them, top-down, fixing, forcing outcomes. Indeed, we become, um, as good people as we are, we become part of the problem. And with that, we kind of like looked at some major global issues, and we started the skills of mapping, not only fact-finding, but also be able to relate the facts. It's not important, it's important for us to know the facts, but we also need to know the relationships of these facts together. So students, they learned, learned about bringing these issues then actually finding the facts, but actually also be able to see, to map it and see how they are related to one another, what effects, who gets affected, and what affects what, what affects whom. Um, thanks to Dr. Karen uh, Wigan, uh, who um, uh, from Stanford University, uh, she suggested this idea of defamiliarizing the globe. And the students, they love the idea of flipping things. Like if Mexico uh, was up north and uh, just the way we see the world, is that also part of the problem? Is that the way we impact things, the way we see it? So if Canada was at, in, in, in our south and Mexico was uh, north, would we have more um, fair agreements with them? You know, would we think about these agreements differently? So it was like really good that to, to see that if we flip the eloquent laws of economics and flip them and see that actually the people at the bottom, you know, they, they, they would be at top, would we change our economic policies? So these were the like kind of things that by defamiliarizing our, ourselves with the way we usually look at things, we kind of like went into more re to, to do research about them. So um, that uh, like really motivated us to look into how can change come from, you know, we are always looking, remember, fixing top down. But if we are flipping everything, so can it be bottom up? Can, it, you can, now that can the bottom can be top now? Can, can it be that actually we would look at every community and see everything that they need is already they have? Gifts, talents, connections, um, institutions, they really de don't need anybody to come and fix them. Only on, and only if we can kind of create the space in which these things can happen, uh, can be helpful. So we looked into asset-based community development, looking at that, that, you know, doing learning skills about appreciative inquiry. So how do we inquire about, you know, what's going on? And based on that, do asset mapping. The, the, the community has its own mapping, uh, its, its own gifts and talents by in inquiring into them and be able, now that we have learned, mapping things and connecting uh, not only the facts but also the relationship of the facts together, we can actually now change also our attitude and our values, that how we see them, that it's no longer from a scare, you know, now we move from a scare to care and we are moving from what's wrong to what's strong about a community. So that was, that was something that, that the students, they, they, uh, they really liked to challenge that. So they came up also, um, they like to do experientially, and there was enough space in there for students to experience these things. So one of the things they came up with is a commitment to change as a social, seeing the, themselves as a source of things. So uh, they came up with the idea of a pledge that every job that they take, they would take into consideration the consequence of that job and the companies that they work for. 
they kind of like started like doing these exhibitions about um, recycling, about um, composting, and hold them regularly around the campus. They had these visuals um, that it was the, the uh, kind of, like of, of uh, the 17 goals, that the, it became pretty familiar around the campus. The smile cards were fun because they kind of like understood the impact of ripple effect, that, that, that you know, you have made me smile, now I'm, I'm going to make you a smile, tag, tag along and just keep passing it. Again, something, some, something that, that experientially they can feel it themselves. And they had these hearts that they, they came from uh, Gandhi's ashram in India, women's in Gandhi's ashram in India, they have made them and, uh, and, and passing them along. They started like having this campaign about bringing uh, plants uh, from their backyard and their mugs that they're at home they are not using and make them and send them home. So kind of like seeing the socialist skills of, of working with others and working in different power contexts um, of that. They also came up with the idea of the essay and art contest, and this was when um, our department, like English department and art department, they uh, uh, collaborated with us to create this based on learning and researching, and the library was a great source for research, uh, researching the 17 uh, United Nations sustainable, uh, Sustainability Goals. So these were kind of like a fun thing for them to do. And last thing, um, the podcast. The podcast with global leaders were, was really fun for me. Um, available on Apple Podcasts and uh, Spotify, please, it's free. Please, <laughs> please make, make sure you, you look it up, subscribe, and so, you know, it, it's free, support it. Uh, so podcast uh, was like with, uh, with, with global citizens. Um, someone like Mr. Jess Mark, who started this wheelchair basketball, who actually goes to the hot zones of, um, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, take these teams and create these teams, work with them, and take them to international championship. He has like great stories to tell about like, you know, his experience with people in the, in the hot zones. Dr. Sara Safari, who received the uh, uh, Global Citizenship Award, a uh, Mount, uh, Mount Everest climber uh, that, um, she survived 2015 avalanche, the glacier saved her. And at, at that moment, she uh, promised that she will, if she comes back, the next trips and the other two, two seven summits, and particular to Everest, it won't be about just climbing the Everest. It would be about um, that, that she would come back and, and she would empower women in particular. And she found the, uh, the uh, NGO, found, found your, uh, Climb Your Everest, uh, which empowers women, and she works very closely with the Nepali girls. And lastly, Mr. Arun Gandhi, uh, the grandson of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who applies the principles of nonviolence to every Thing that he does. Uh, this is just a sample. Like there are like m a, a lot more, and uh, that would be something that would be um, that I would just continue doing because I really, really enjoy talking to people, and I really enjoy hearing their stories. And uh, and for them, particularly in the context of global citizenship, um, it's um, it's 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 fun to hear. Well, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it. It was, that was, uh, that was emotional. So you guys, I just, uh, such a great job. Um, I'd like to open things up to questions from anyone and to get as many questions as possible. Uh, just try to keep the one question per person and uh, uh, you can ask a question to um, either or any of these three, Mark, Amy, uh, or Fran. Um, so, Feel free to raise your hand. Um, all three of you, I, I was really moved to see that you're focusing on climate change and, and sustainability. Uh, when I was an Epic Fellow, that was my, that, and still is, that's my mission as well. Um, and I was also moved to see you working together on these issues. The question I had was whether, whether you'd had any time yet to test drive these with student populations and if you feel like this generation of students is responding differently to these messages in any way, um, not just to your messages, but just to the climate crisis in, 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 in general. Uh, I think this generation does. Uh, they just don't know what to do and uh, where to go to get like solid information. 
Um, but I think they, they definitely do. Just the way they uh, re uh, responded to Earth Day, it tells me, and then ever since then, uh, in every classroom they bring issues up. Uh, it tells me that they are absolutely interested. It's, it's, it, we can put that issue at the, at the center of, of our teaching, and they would really enjoy that. So I haven't had a chance to sort of test drive my modules that I've created for my EPIC project with my intro class, but um, based on just conversations with them about other topics that we have, I would agree that I think that they respond a little differently. They're starting, you know, they hear about it a lot more in the news. Oh, this is the most extreme weather we've had, or California's flooding. And I, I think that's creating an awareness that something is going on that clearly is, is having an impact. So um, to that extent, I think that, that they are uh, having a different attitude than perhaps uh, generations have in the past. Students. Yeah, it, it's geography has been given a new lease on life with climate change. You know, it's no longer about place names and cities and resources. So our students are really totally focused on that. But I think the, the main point of your question is how, how are they grappling with it intellectually and how do they begin to process their future? And those are really tough issues to even bring forward because, you know, as Fran was mentioning, we're trying to be optimistic about their future and yet there's these issues that kind of pull it back. And so um, you want to put the facts out there, but it, you have to be also careful of what you bring to the classroom. And so that's sort of a dance that we're, we're playing with. Like Amy, I haven't really gotten into the Russian thing. A, a lot of things don't necessarily register on our uh, on their radar at, at our level, at uh, you know, first year community college students. So um, they're dimly aware of it, but I, I don't think they see the interconnectedness that, that Fran has been in, uh, in, implying. I think it's important to really uh, address the issue of defeatism in, in the classroom because uh, I had heard from students that in the past they had taken courses and halfway through they dro drop it because it would make them sad and, and disempowered. And, um, and then we don't want to be, be also optimistic that they would say, well, oh, well that's not true. Uh, but then kind of like actually take it on as uh, beating the defeatism around it and what we can do. Thank you so much for your presentations. As someone who might be applying for an EPIC fellow, this is more of a process question. So how did Jonas and Gary and the professors that you contacted at Stanford work with you and develop your projects? It's for everyone. Um, it was really amazing to work with Jonas and, and, and Gary because they are such a great, and also Kristen, uh, you know, they are such a great source of support and uh, as we kind of talk to them about what we are working on, connecting us to um, professors that they, they are in, in that field, uh, so we could have like a conversation, get in touch with them and, and, and they would share their wisdom and their, mm, you know, uh, their practices or their research. Uh, it was really, really helpful. I, I can just add that Gary and I do very little, really. It's like so, it's so driven by um, the fellows, you know. Uh, we just try to create a space where, um, where, you know, you can collaborate and get to know each other. And, and so it's really all the fellows um, that, that, you know, drive these projects. And, that's why it's so, it's so wonderful to see how collaborative uh, your projects are. I think we got really lucky with the, with the collaboration. We, we had a really nice dovetail, um, many of us, so. And not just with you, but with Stanford. Um, so I have to say, I didn't really utilize Stanford faculty per se, like individual faculty in the psych department. Um, you, what I am teaching is intro, and you know it's very, very broad, and it's not somebody's specialty niche that they teach intro. To the extent that they have interesting projects that transcend, for example, the weird mod, the weird model, that is interesting, absolutely. But most of that research is being done collaboratively collaboratively across the globe, and so I wanted to students to be aware um, of all these different activities, but I didn't want to centralize them 
you know, within a United States institution. Um, I would rather highlight Chinese uh, fellows, for example, uh, in Shanghai and the research they're doing there, than just constantly focus it back because that's always been the problem. We talk about Western laboratories and, you know, uh, the, the kind of weird faculty of which I'm a member, so I'm I'm definitely <laughs> I, I, I am definitely part of the weird uh, problem. But I really wanted to not put the spotlight on any one person to the extent that there are wonderful medical anthropology archives at Stanford and the inst um, the various cultural institutions uh, here from where you could pull like for example, Eastern perspectives, because some of this stuff is very hard to find. When you're talking about finding the origins that eventually contribute to the idea of what we call psychology today from you know early Chinese di dynasties, like where do you go to find that information? And that's really where the extraordinary collections that are housed at, at, at this university come in. And so, I was utilizing the library all the time and all the other special collections. And to that extent, getting that access, um, you know, being able to email and say, you know, can you put me in touch with this um, librarian and that librarian, that was um, amazing. Um, to put a finer point on your question, and I don't mean this as any uh, criticism, but uh, I was trying to get uh, the Russian experts at Stanford, which there are so many, you know, like I went to talk to Condoleezza Rice, and, you know, et cetera. Um, it was really hard for me to make a connection with them because they're so busy. And I could hard, I felt I wasn't even capable of framing an appropriate question uh, at a baby level to get an expert to comment on. So I was a little frustrated with, uh, you know, I was hoping that I would, you know, get kind of information uh, that I was, uh, imagining was out there. I'm not sure it's out there, mm -hmm. uh, to tell you the truth. So uh, uh, everyone's focused on Ukraine. No, no one's focused on uh, Russian Far East. So maybe there's far Russian Far East experts here. Uh, so uh, uh, we're all so busy. I had hardly time to even do this project in, in, in times of doing everything else with all of our students, teaching five courses, and et cetera. And, and they're 10 times busier. So um, I don't necessarily think you would expect Stanford professors to sort of hold your hand or focus and maybe they'll have a, a coffee with you. I, I don't mean that as a criticism in any way, shape or form, you know, that's just keeping it real. I think the experience is different for like every yeah. fellow. Um, yeah. Yeah. It depends who you connect with. Um, and like Yulia and I knew you, uh, you, you made some really good connections. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, you know, fellows find different paths and use, utilize different uh, sources and resources. Uh, I want to shout out to the librarians, okay? <laughs> Y'all are awesome here, man. You guys know your collections. Hi, everyone. My name is Sirian Villavicencio, political science professor, co-chair of the department at San Joaquin Delta College. Um, and it's great. My fellow colleagues, congratulations on uh, finishing your, your epic program. And we hope that you know, we'll have an opportunity to do so here in the future. That being said, I was really um, fascinated with the interdisciplinary approach that all of you have taken. You're from different institutions, and yet I saw like a through line between your presentations. And so first question, was that intentional, or was that a requirement of the EPIC program? Because I think that clearly allows for more <laughs> effective collaboration. And number two, in terms of institutionalizing this work now that you've done what are you going to do next with this work are you sharing this with perhaps other faculty members within your department are you going to internationalize the curriculum with them maybe talking with again with administrators your dean perhaps right what's the next step um, that you have again after completing this program so thank you really learned a lot from all of you thank you I'll uh, take a answer just to the first part of the question. You can answer the second part. Um, after one or two meetings, we realized, from my perspective, trauma informs all of these at a certain level uh, with, uh, with our studenthood and, and all these different topics, the difficulties in, in working with community college students. And so there was a through theme of trauma that we all, mm -hmm. we all could have mm -hmm. benchmarked part of that for everyone's talk. And, and, and our collaboration sort of got going with that concept. And, and then that's my answer to the question. 
well, global studies as I teach, it, it is just inherently um, interdisciplinary. You know, we can't go any, uh, you know, we have to see the interconnection, inter intersectionality of many different things. But uh, for sure, you know, the interest that the art department and also the, uh, actually, the, most notably, the English department they took t in order to understand uh, and research this, it was, it was great. And I'm committed to, like next year, to have that conversation with the STEM program, because I think that would be really the one that, that also would bring, you know, breathe life into it on our campus. Uh, for sure, institutionalizing it is, is, is the vision of, of the global studies, yeah. Yeah, um, so there was an old movie. I, I, it, I'm dating myself now, but it was, it was my big fat Greek wedding. And in that, in that movie, the father is like, give me any word and I'll tell you how it comes from Greek. Yeah. <laughs> and that's me with psychology. <laughs> give me any topic and I'll tell you how psych is gonna fit in somewhere, especially if it deals with humans. Um, and, and I don't mean that by any way to say, oh, it's all coming back to psych, just simply that I, I love my discipline, I love what I do, and I see that the only reason my discipline uh, is what it is is because of all of these other disciplines and how they inform upon it, because we live in a world, and a world with many different areas, and how we think about those areas and how we think about that geography, that, that's, yes, it's, geography. exactly, yes. it's all <laughs> forming in that. Geography so, is the mother of all sciences. Exactly. So it was very natural, especially as I started talking to not just these two, um, but all of the Epic Fellows. And you know, I've mentioned a couple of them who are coming up um, shortly. It, it made sense to start collaborating and having that cross-disciplinary um, ideas and, and things of that nature. Um, as far as where is it going, um, I do want to put it on. Uh, I do want to put it on Creative Commons. I do want to put it out there. Um, I think eventually, I I would like it to be a more formalized OER text. Um, we do have something called cultural psychology, but that is not what this is. Cultural psychology is a very specific course. It's a very specific section. It has a very specific set of aims. This is. We are teaching an introduction course, so it's the introduction to the field, and we're just broadening the perspective. We're giving some other flavor. And that's a really different type of book, a different type of introduction to psychology text, and you know that's where I'd like to go with it. But I'm always happy to share, because I, I'm also a big open educational resource per person, so I am very happy to share whatever I have. I'd say collaboration is not a requirement, but uh, it is the goal or the dream, um, making you guys the dream team. <laughs> it's an emergence. Yes, yes, yes it's an yes, emergence. It's yeah. Hi. Um, hi. I, I, I just want to see you. Um, so I'm Sarah. I'm a PhD neuroscience student here. So I'm really interested in the student perspective. So as like thinking of curriculum as something like cyclic, I was like, where did you get your ideas from? And is there a platform when you implement this to get student feedback to like change how, like some of the topics or some of the focus of what you're studying or teaching? Thank you. Okay, so since mine's I think the most like specifically focused across a whole course, when you teach, when you have an introduction to psychology course, there are certain stu student learning objectives that have to be in there. So even if my students are like, I hate the sensation and perception chapter, uh -huh. I'm like, I'm sorry, <laughs> we have to learn that. That is one of the things you need to learn by the time you're done with this class. Um, you know, to the extent of where, where did we get our ideas, I, I think it just comes from seeing the holes in our own literature and in our own discipline as we have taught. Um, all of us are kind of senior educators here. We've been teaching for some time. Um, and, and, and you just start to see, huh, you know, I had read about that and we're doing that section and wow, they don't even mention any of this. Like that's, that's weird. Um, so, you know, it's one of these things that I, I think that we kind of saw where the holes were. Um, as far as implementation, um, I'm planning on implementing these modules in my intro to psych course in the fall. As soon as they're tight enough, um, you know, this is all done out of our own labor. So I have to make sure all the accessibility 
is, is, is in there. Um, you know, if I'm writing the code, I'm writing it. I don't have an instructional designer on hand. Um, and, and so, you know, I do want to put those modules out there and get feedback. I've certainly gotten feedback on assessments and assignments, and they do love when they can tell their stories. And you know, we're going to have an Epic Fellow talk about kind of that process. So we know that they want to talk about a lot of this stuff and talk about it in a global or at least a broader context than. I read this and I don't really have questions about it, but it's really interesting. You know, I mean, there's, and so um, that's at least, that drove a lot of how I ended up designing the project the way I did. Well, well, I know there's more questions and I know there's more answers too. Um, so uh, hold those questions and uh, you, this is what the symposium is for, is that after these talks you can all, you can ask as many questions during, uh, during the breaks or, or lunch or, or um, you know, anytime or email and really like, you know, broaden that collaboration. Um, so uh, thank you, Mark, Amy, and Fran. One more time. And we're going to move on to uh, our next three presenters. So we have Juliana, Michelle, and Elisa. And first up, we have uh, Juliana on her project, Expanding the Borders of Personal Finance Curriculum Through Global Perspectives. Good morning. Buenos dias. I love it. So I'm Juliana Mendez. Um, I am a business faculty at Yuba Community College. It's about 45 minutes north of Sacramento. And um, Today I'm going to be talking about expanding the borders of personal finance curriculum through global perspectives. So for my EPIC project, I created a Canvas course package, and um, this is going to be launching uh, fall 2023 next semester through my General Business II course, uh, Personal Finance at Yuba College. So I'm very excited. And uh, even though it's designed for personal finance curriculum, I am also intending it for interdisciplinary use. All right, so before getting into the course package itself, I'm gonna go a talk a little bit about why it's important to globalize personal finance curriculum. Then I'll talk a little bit about student impact, so all the benefits to our students. Uh, I'll talk about my epic journey. Everyone keeps saying, you know, it's gonna be epic. <laughs> and, and finally go into the course package itself. So why globalize personal finance curriculum? Why is that important? In order to answer that question, we first have to look at the student population that we serve. The California Community College system is the largest and most diverse system of higher education in the country. And looking at uh, a little bit at some of the chancellor's data, we can see here um, the chart on the right is data from fall 2021, and the one on the left is from today, from the chancellor's website. So almost 70% come from diverse ethnic backgrounds. And, you know, community college, um, our students, our classrooms are, are filled with students from just a vast multitude of races, ethnicities, cultures. And, you know, we talked a little bit uh, this morning about immigration. You know, we, we teach a lot of immigrants, a lot of children of immigrants, and the community college is a pathway for them to have education and career opportunities. So um, just very, very diverse classrooms that we have. And taking it a step further and looking at their financial status, um, in 20, fall 2021, 54% of the community college students applied and received some, some form of financial aid, so grants, scholarships, loans. And about two-thirds of those students came from annual household incomes of 50, less than $50,000. And a third come from annual uh, household incomes of less than $20,000. And so just really suggesting that a significant portion of our community college students come from low-income backgrounds. So the issue with this is that research shows that children that are born into poverty are more likely to remain in poverty as adults, so creating this poverty cycle. Um, in the child grows up in poverty, it's disadvantaged in education and skills, they struggle in many areas of life, they fail to escape that cycle, and then their family lives in poverty, then they go and have kids, and the cycle continues. And so this is caused by many different things, but it includes limited education, limited job opportunities, um, stress, and then you know we've talked a lot about trauma, the trauma of living in poverty. And so um, again, just uh, 
Um, these things can make it very challenging for, our, for individuals and families to get out of these poverty cycles. And so traditionally, uh, in personal finance classes, we teach you know, some basic you know, budgeting, investing, credit, you know, how to increase your credit, retirement, insurance, taxes. And these topics, while they're great and important, we're missing a really important piece in our financial uh, education. And that missing element is something that I call the global perspective. And that is how our attitudes, our beliefs, and our perspectives about money come from places all over the world. And these global influences shape our financial behavior and our financial you know, patterns, how we manage you know, money in our life. And so what's missing is this awareness of our, you know, what's behind our financial decision making. And so without having that perspective, we're really giving students this knowledge that they might not be able to implement due to these limiting beliefs or these negative patterns that they have you know, going on in, in generation after generation. So, um, so it, it's, we're doing them a disservice by not including this piece in their financial education. So by including this perspective, we create a, a lot of benefits for our students. Uh, for one, we create self-awareness about these habits, these generational patterns, these negative limiting beliefs, and we give them the tools and empower them to break these cycles. And that leads them to you know, make improved decisions or improved decision making on their finance related kind of um, issues that come across in their life, ultimately leading them to better financial outcomes. And uh, in addition to this, it promotes that cross-cultural communication in the classroom, so students begin to understand what motivates their peers. And, and as in, in a career, you know, as they go on in their careers, even that can be beneficial to them. And uh, it challenges them to think critically. So um, I want to shift and talk a little bit about my epic journey in building the course package. So in building the course, I really wanted to leverage the Stanford resources and try to you know, learn as much as I could. And I started Googling you know, <laughs> or searching for Stanford professors that teach personal finance. And personal finance is not a super common topic at all the community colleges, even at four-year universities. And so I found um, you know, several professors here at Stanford. And I just decided to you know, blind email, shoot, shoot an email. And, and I uh, came across Angela, who's actually here today. Thank you so much for being here. So, um, she is the associate director of a program called Mind Over Money here at Stanford, and it's a financial wellness program for Stanford students. Um, it gives them access to a lot of financial resources, and they have its open, you know, videos and information on the website. And so I've linked a lot of those things to my course now uh, because they're so amazing. Um, so such great resources that are open to the public, but intended for the Stanford students. And um, she also teaches financial wellness for a healthy long life here at Stanford. And so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Angela was so amazing and just spent hours, literally hours with me and we went over all of the different um, work that she's doing both in the program and through her, her course. And she shared with me a lot of really unique and interesting perspectives and that really kind of got my, my brain going and got me thinking and um, you know, just kind of got me ready for, um, you know, kind of mentally preparing you know, what the structure was gonna be. And the other thing about Angela is that she's involved um, in the first generation uh, and or low income alumni network, it's called FLAN here at Stanford. She invited me um, to speak to some of the Stanford um, low income and first generation students. And so I had a speaking event where I shared financial strategies for recent grads, but the, the audience was actually soon to be grads and alumni. So it was really interesting and I share that with you because some of the questions that I got from the audience um, during the presentations were super interesting and they asked me questions around like balancing that, that desire to want to build wealth and like come up you know, financially, but also you know, maybe having a cultural uh, expectation that you're going to support your parents or things like that. So it was really fascinating because I think it highlighted that it's not just community college students, but so many people could benefit from something like this. And um, anyway, so, so that was uh, really interesting. And so one of the things that <clears throat> Angela introduced me to was um, the personal finance ecosystem put together by the National uh, Endowment for Financial Education. And so I, I don't want to get too into it, but I just wanted to show you, this is a visual roadmap that lays out um, basically the foundations that underpin a person's state of financial well-being. And the main thing I want to highlight is that 
the financial well-being in the middle, the finance knowledge, like what we know, that's only one piece of this bigger puzzle. It's a very intricate, you know, uh, map that really lays out all these different fi foundational factors and uh, behavioral influ influencers that ultimately lead us to that state of financial well-being. So, so using this, my conversations with Angela, you know, learning about all of the work that she's doing, and of course, all the amazing feedback that I got from the fellows, I came up with the nine most influential factors um, that I believe influence someone's money mindset, financial behaviors, habits, and patterns. The first one, culture and ethnicity. So what are the traditions in that culture that might influence how you spend your money? Are you saving for a quinceanera, you know, the sweet 15 party? Is uh, wealth an emphasis in your culture, that sort of thing? Um, gender, we've talked a little bit about it today. How is uh, gender viewed in your culture? How is gender viewed in your country? And then we had religion. You know, some, some um, religions require you to donate a percent of your income to the church. Um, some religions view uh, wealth as the root of all evil, so just kind of highlighting those things. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed up here. Society, you know, how the social pressures of like, do we go invest in GameStop, you know, social media, that kind of thing. Um, the U.S. education system highlighting that we, our education system, doesn't uh, prioritize financial literacy in other parts of the world they do. Um, our family and friends, of course, the peer pressure that we feel. And also sometimes that's all we've seen, so that's all we know. Politics, we've we talked a lot about that today. Um, but also, you know, do you care about social justice so you donate all your extra money to social causes? Do you, you know, are you more conservative with your money, that kind of thing. And then geography, <laughs> we talked about that. You know, where, where do we live in relation to the rest of, the rest of the world? What is our economics like? What is our immigration like? You know, all of those things. And then finally, our economic status. Did we grow up poor? Did we come from poverty? Or did we come from wealth? So, um, I took these nine factors and built a course package. So I designed it um, twofold. The first is full integration into a personal finance course. The second is an add-on module that is designed for interdisciplinary use. And I did this because there is no financial literacy prioritization in any of our higher education um, institutions. And so I really wanted to create a module that people could just kind of plug in you know, to their course and just you know, use it and make it easy for them. So for the full course, I, it's designed to basically take these nine elements and you integrate them into the traditional personal finance topics that you teach. So if you're teaching about um, investments, maybe that week we talk about religion. How does religion and your views on religion impact your investing perspectives? I use religion here as an example. They each have reading, articles, videos, charts, infographics. We have learning resources, and then on the other end, we have the student activities, which are reflective assignments and class discussions. So this is sort of what they would look like in the module. And then we have pre and post module surveys, weekly assignments, weekly discussions, a comprehensive reflection assignment, a self-improvement final, and then just a collection of financial literacy resources. So for the comprehensive reflection, they identify their most influential factors, both positive and negative. They identify key uh, biases, negative patterns, um, money attitudes, and then finally they um, reflect on their biggest takeaways. And then they uh, develop a, a specific plan to improve that, that awareness you know, and, and behavior around key factors identified, specific action steps that can be taken, and an accountability plan. So I wanted to show a quick example. So for culture and ethnicity, I would show them a map. You know, we, we integrate maps into our curriculum. So I would show them how Kakaibo is a Japanese savings method that is used, you know, in Japan. And Alcancia is a Filipino practice of saving money at home. Um, Kuri Kalyanam is an Indian practice of raising money for large purchases by hosting a party and getting everyone to contribute. <laughs> and then Harambi is a Kenyan practice of leveraging community to help, uh, to help fund, you know, events in the community. And then the Tanda is a Latin American informal uh, rotating savings and credit association. So we would follow this up by asking them questions like, what are some of the common um, financial practices or beliefs in your culture or your ethnic community? How has your cultural or ethnic background shaped your attitude towards money? And what are some wage ways in which your mindset might differ from, um, you know, from other cultures? And then another quick example, geography, one that Elisa actually introduced me to. So I embedded a website that features 449 families from 66 countries, and you can click on them, and this is how much they live off for that month. And you can click on it, 
and you can see how that family lives, you can see the map of where they live, and you can read about them and see this is a family of six, you know, and or they have six children, three adults, and they have a monthly income of $198 a month. So just really trying to, to get, you know, the students to be reflective. So we ask them then questions, how long have you or your family lived in the U.S. and how do you think this has shaped your money mindset? Um, how do you think uh, living in the U.S. versus other parts of the world has affected your financial outlook or situation? And then how might people in other parts of the world live with an income like yours? So the add-on module is just, you know, I, I highlighted a couple disciplines that it could be implemented to. I thought about EOPS um, career and life skills classes because those students tend to be low income. Psychology, economics, ethnic studies, business, obviously, sociology. So a lot of courses that you could just kind of plug it into. And then for that one, we just have, you know, I, I just uh, did it as an example four here, but instructors could pick the four that are most related to their um, subject. And then they do <clears throat> one reflection, one class discussion, and one self-improvement plan. And then for the second module, they have surveys, um, identify key financial co concepts and a financial plan that they build. This is intended if, because uh, you're assuming no financial literacy content, so I just want to include something in case, you know, instructors wanted to add that. That's it. The course will be available on Canvas Commons by searching Juliana Mendez or Globalizing Personal Finance. And thank you. Thank you so much, Juliana. Um, next, we have uh, Michelle McFarlane, who will be talking about uh, her project, Decolonizing the Uni United States Food System. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is so exciting. I'm so happy to be here. Um, and I have a really hard time sitting down, and I'm also a big flats, and there's a lot of cords back there, so I don't want to give you more than you bargained for this morning, so I'm just going to stand up here. Um, so I'm Michelle McFarlane, and I am an agriculture faculty member at Sierra College in Rockland, right outside of Sacramento. Um, I am the department chair, and I'm also the distance learning coordinator. Um, and my project is decolonizing the United States food system, so just a small task. So um, I have been listening today, and one of the things that happened is I arrived late, late, late last night, and the um, Epic Fellows got to enjoy a dinner, and I was so torn and so disappointed that I couldn't be there, but I had to be there, be at Sierra College for our graduation with our students. So with that, that made me really think about, um, you know, the importance of food. And of course, it's important to sustain us, and it's a biological need, and those nutrients are so important, but it's so much more than that. It's a, it's, there's cultural practices around it. We use it to, as rites of path, to celebrate rites of passages, to celebrate accomplishments, um, and to just celebrate one another. And so it's such a big, um, commonality between all humans, right? No matter where we are in our geographical location on the globe. So in the United States, well, let me back up a little bit. So about 30 years ago, I was sitting in a classroom after transferring from Butte Community College to, um, to Chico State. And I was listening to a lecture about the history of agriculture economics in the United States, industrial agriculture. And so, you know, did my thing. Found myself 20 years later in a classroom, or I was actually at my dining room table preparing for a lecture the next morning that I would be giving in a classroom about the history of agriculture economics. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking there are a lot of people and a lot of stories and a lot of experiences missing from my knowledge about this. And so at that point, um, I was very, very interested in sharing other stories and learning about them myself because I felt like my education failed me at that point. So, um, in the United States, we have a very robust and diverse food system. It's industrialized. Like any food system, there are inequities around it. Everything from resources, economic resources, to um, natural resources, all of, the, all of those things. However, in the United States, the agriculture industry really prides itself on providing this robust food and this availability of food to the masses. However, um, agriculture education typically doesn't talk about um, the, the kind of social aspects of it, social aspects, aspects of food, production, distribution. 
and so on. And so that was something that I really wanted to change, is for people to be represented in the story that contribute to the diversity of agriculture um, and our food system and the food that we have available to us as um, people in this um, industrial food system in the United States. And so um, I began to do that. And um, so my project was developing a course in, um, that focuses on decolonizing the United States food system. So the goals were to develop the course, get local approval, and then schedule the course. So local approval meeting at Sierra College. And as those of you that are community college faculty know, we have curriculum committees and all of that stuff that we have to, to get through. And I'll come back to that in a minute. And then disseminate um, the information beyond Sierra College. Because in agriculture education, like I said, some of these stories are not represented and the social aspects of it um, really need to be shared. And so the steps that I took in doing this was um, research and, and enhancing the knowledge base. And so like many other folks here in the EPIC program, I um, relied on the resources provided to us by Stanford, which are so robust and amazing. Um, worked on the course outline development, and so I have a course outline, and then um, proposed that to our local curriculum. And I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Um, <clears throat> so right now where I am is here and here, developing the course content and disseminating and sharing. And so, um, let me just keep going, the complexities here. So I want to back up and talk a little bit about some of the pushback that I received. And you would think, oh, a course about food and the history of food? No problem, right? Um, and so it was, so I started out a few years ago, like I mentioned, this has been something I've wanted to do for a long time, in formalizing this in agriculture education. And um, I went to an organization, it's our deputy sector navigators that we have for community colleges. I don't know if anybody's familiar with those in here or not. And I went to them and said, hey, I have this great idea. We, you know, we talk so much about the history of agriculture, the importance of it to the economy, to people, but yet we don't include the stories of all the contributors in this. And, um, and I proposed what I wanted to do to share, um, you know, talking about in starting pre-colonial times in the United States with indigenous practices to um, folks that contribute to building the um, agricultural economy because of the transatlantic slave trade, and so on and so on, to our migrant workers that we rely on still today and exploit labor of today. So I, I, I posed this, and the person said, oh, we can't do that. And I was like, why? It's going to make agriculture look bad. <laughs> it's like, OK. Um, so I did it on my own instead of you know, making it a broader thing. And so um, that was just one story of, of kind of the pushback I got there. Um, local politics also. So I mentioned one of the things that I wanted to do was, um, well, I, I'm still going to get it through our curriculum process. So for those of you that are involved in shared governance, which I'm assuming a lot of you are at community colleges, you know that um, Academic Senate has a 10 plus one areas of purview, one of them being curriculum. And so right now, we have a curriculum moratorium on new courses because we're having a power struggle over who controls course cap, which is how many people are in a course. So the course is written, and it's sitting in our curriculum queue. So that is, that is kind of interesting. Another aspect that we're um, seeing is um, we, are, we, just, we have a new ethnic studies department at Sierra. And um, I wanted to cross-list this to fill the ethnic studies requirement. And um, there's a lot of pushback at, on that as well, which understandable. They're building a program and so on. So hopefully one of these days um, we, will, we will get there with that. So like agriculture and the multidisciplinary complexities, I always like the onion there with the lots of layers. Mm -hmm. We have all the layers of um, the complexities of getting these, these projects um, in place. And so um, that is kind of interesting. Um, so I have a, um, a QR code here for a website where I have the course outline um, of the course as well as some of the resources and information about um, the plans and so on. 
that if y'all want to check out, I would love it. And it is a dynamic um, website. I will be adding more to it. So my goals have shifted a little bit with the project. So I'm going to go back to this slide here. Um, so I'm in this, developing the course content right now, and I will post a Canvas shell and put it in um, Canvas Commons, just like some of my other colleagues there. Um, and then once it gets through curriculum, it will be scheduled at um, Sierra College. But what is near and dear to my heart is really changing the narratives that we share with our students on a, a broader scale and to really include that global perspective and that equitable lens. And so my plan is regardless of what happens at the local level is to um, really push it out more at the, the national level and the state level through education. So next Monday, I'm going to the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity. And um, I'm on a panel there where I'll be talking about this project and the, and the EPIC program here at Stanford University. I'm also um, sharing it at every moment I can at Sierra College. Um, and I've incorporated some of the, the content into my courses um, that I taught this semester and I will continue to do so. I'm part of the Emoja program at Sierra College and um, I test ran a lot of the stuff um, in that course today, or today. It feels like today, it's been a long semester. <laughs> this semester and um, it was well received. I got feedback from students and tweaked things and, and all of that so I'm really, really excited about the future of this and, and getting the word out and sharing it. So with that, I'd love to express my gratitude to everyone in the EPIC, EPIC program. And um, just a heartfelt thank you to everyone that has supported us, to my colleagues in the program, to our mentors, um, to, to Kristen who herds cats, like yes. all of us, all the time. It has been so valuable and most importantly, um, it has provided resources and opportunities not only for me, but for community colleges across the state to support our students, and I think that's what it's really about. So thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, and for our finer, final uh, presenter on this panel, we have Elisa Queenan. Hello, hello. Um, I'm also gonna stand over here. I don't feel like I can talk when I'm gotta be stationary. It makes me forget everything. So I gotta move, you know, I don't know. It's nine o'clock at night and I'm very tired. Most teachers at this point are getting ready for bed, maybe thinking about their class the next day, maybe not. Ours is just getting ready to start. I'm jumping onto Zoom with my colleague Beth Flynn and our Kurdish Iraqi colleague Talib. We're on Zoom, our students are ready to jump on. We're creating a prototype for a sustainability problem that we've been working on. Our students start populating. We have all the Zoom, you know, boxes popping up and all, they all start chattering. There's conversations happening in Kurdish. There's conversations happening in English. There's conversations happening in Spanish. This is our international collaboration. This is our virtual exchange. My name is Dr. Elisa Queenan. I'm going to walk you through this. For us and our international collaboration and our virtual exchange, we're one and the same. For you, they don't have to be. But when I refer to this, we, they were one and the same for us. So first of all, I want to thank Epic for accepting Beth and I as a team. Um, I don't know if that's a common practice, but I appreciate you being, being willing. So I'm going to present, and Beth is going to present after lunch, so you'll get the whole scope of what we did. So what are we going to do? I'm going to talk about how it started. So we've been doing this for a few years, and so I want to talk about kind of where we started, some things that we've done. I'm going to briefly touch on human-centered design. I'm not going to give it its due, but I'm going to briefly touch on it. Talk about our current EPIC project, if you want to try it, and then some cultural considerations. So we're going to start with how it started. For us, it began with COVID. Now, for everybody, right, life was normal, then it's not normal. We teach at Porterville College in the Central Valley. Our student base is primarily um, below the poverty line, minority, first gen. Going online fully was not ideal. And so we had been talking about how do we, Im how do we implement high impact practices. I pulled out experiential learning specifically because that was one that we were like, okay, if we're gonna be online, how can we add an experiential element? Beth's gonna cover the other high impact practices that we, that we work towards. Um, we found our path, oops, we found our path 
at the beginning through the Global Solution Sustainability Challenge. Now, this is something that we did through IREX. Um, it's supported by the Stevens Initiative. Uh, Ambassador Stevens was killed in Benghazi a, a number of years ago. And so they, they established a connection between US students and students in the MENA region. And so what happens is you're partnered, you and your students are partnered with a team in Iraq and Jordan and any of the other MENA region countries, and you work to, a, to address a sustainability development goal. And you come up with a solution. The basic like outline of what we did is it's a one semester project, you meet weekly. Meetings with the binational team usually takes place either in early mornings or late at night, primarily because of time zone differences. And then we meet with our students, I mean now during our normal student time, our normal class time that we have. Uh, we started with Soren University the last few years, years, we've been with Arabelle University Polytechnic, um, and we're continuing to work with them and research with them. I'm gonna get to cultural considerations at the end, but I really wanna to touch on it really quick now. Now, I have lived abroad. I have worked abroad. Does it make you good with culture? It doesn't make you good with culture. Culture has to be, has to be intentionally sought after all the time. You can't get lazy about it. We have had so many misalignments where we have just like, totally not gotten it. I'm going to give you two short examples. One, we started and my colleague Talib said, Lisa, you set the Zoom link for our class. Excuse me? Am I your secretary? That was my thought, right? Like, that was my thought. Like, one, we don't usually speak in the imperative, but like, okay. But I also realized in that moment that I was, one, being reactive, and two, not being empathetic or curious. Like, why was he telling me I need to set our Zoom link? You know, it's a small thing, right? But like, why? And so I reached out to him, I'm like, hey, I'm just curious, like, why is it important to you that I take this role? And he said, well, you know, Iraq took a few million Syrian refugees from the Syrian war. It's put a big strain on our power grid. We're not even guaranteed power after nine. If I'm the host and the power goes out, we lose everybody. Okay, now I just feel like a jerk. Right? But like those moments where you, you come in with assumptions that you think you understand and you don't. Right? And again, I've worked abroad, lived abroad, still misalignments. Okay? Their students, primarily, our Iraqi students, primarily, they love to show honor to their professors and they do so with honorifics. In their country, it translates to deer and honey. Right? So the first class I was in where an Iraqi gentleman called me honey, every one of my students go, <gasps> And I'm looking at it, I'm like, I'm not his honey. Oh, where's HR? Like, this is not being recorded, right? And so, like, like, the misalignment of, like, where culture is shown in one place, where for us, it's a term of endearment, right? A sign of an intimate relationship. And so, how do you find that middle ground where they can show that honor, we can receive that honor, and we don't get sent to HR, right? And so, like, those pieces that we're trying, that we're still trying to work through. So I'm going to come back to this, but I just want to share some of our missteps. Like, we've, ha we've had them. We've had them. So human-centered design. I'm very sad to give you a very sophomore-level response to a very senior-level foundation, right? But I'm going to. So human-centered design is essentially a mindset that overlays design thinking. Now, both of them focus on the people. They focus on the people. It's not just about, I got an idea, I'm gonna design a product, it's gonna be great. It's not about you at all. Not about it. any step of this is it about you. The, the common one that we use for human-centered design is to empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test. Very much like the scientific method, you do it again, right? You do it again, you do it again, you do it again. At no point in any of this do you get to come out. When you're, when you're defining the problem, it's not you defining the problem. You set up a process for the stakeholders, the people who are experiencing the problem, to define the problem. You lead the process, right? The, the prototype that, that you come up with, you don't get the final stamp on it. You have to take it back to the stakeholders and does this work for the problem that you have defined? And so it's very hard for control freaks like us. If you're in this room and a teacher I guarantee you fall in that category because of the fact that we plan every course, every assessment, every interaction, we script our lectures, all of it. You don't get to do that here. And you also don't get to be the expert, which is terrifying for us. 
terrifying. We've made some modifications to the human-centered design process for us. One, we've realized it's very difficult to nurture empathy with your students if you can't teach them how to be curious. The U.S. education system isn't set up to really really nurture curiosity. And so we really had to take a step back and be like, how do we create an environment where we can start working towards curiosity because it's difficult to, to empathize with people. We've also called out the solution and execution, but, uh, but for the sake of this presentation, mine and best, we're gonna stick to the simpler version. Um, again, our foundation was the UN Sustainability Goals. It's a common language. It works well, right? Like it's something that that we can find, we can find connectivity in whatever culture that we're in. Yours doesn't have to use that. Some examples of some things, some problems that our students have addressed. They've addressed power issues and teacher resource shortages in Iraq. They've addressed high unemployment in Jordan, youth isolation in the states. Our students are not pursuing like easy things. Not at all. And again, this is 100% them. The one thing I pulled out of this is I have been shortchanging my students for about 16 years. Like what they are capable of when they are given the freedom to have agency over their own education, I was not aware that it was so robust. Okay, our current EPIC project. Our current EPIC project is primarily focusing on women in Iraq. And this came from our relationship, as we work with our Kurdish Iraqi partners, the same problem keeps arising. Women either aren't getting into post-secondary education, or if they are, they're having a very difficult time entering the labor, labor market afterwards. This is just some background information because this is where we started. That in, in Iraq, they have a national exit exam in ninth grade and 12th grade. I put 8,000, we actually looked at data of over 825,000 Iraqi individuals over the last five years. Only 45.6% of females are even passing this exam, which means the rest don't even get the option to pursue post-secondary education. Now, I will say, men aren't faring much better. They aren't. But the difference is, because of, because of religious and cultural complications, women have a, a far more difficult time entering the labor market, whereas men can do that. And so, Again, our Iraqi counterparts over there are really guiding the boat. And for us, they really want Beth and I to focus, focus on, can we bring entrepreneurial skills to their women? Because if we can, maybe we can bridge that gap for the women who either don't get to do post-secondary education, or even the ones who do get to do it that are still trying to fa find a way to enter the labor market. Now, when you create a, a problem, it has to be quantifiable. You have to be able to test it, right? Did I, meet, did I address my problem or not? We created a problem for both our PC students and for the students in our Kurdish region. And we did so because an international exchange, you have to have a benefit on both sides, right? Like we have to bring something to our PC students also. So for our problem is our students need a diverse learning community. They need to learn how to work with intercultural decision making. And then for our Iraqi, our Iraqi students, Originally, what we wanted to support on, we wanted to put the augmenting support on their 12th grade national exit exam and or developing the entrepreneurial skills, but because of cultural challenges, we are not yet able to support young women. We have some safety things that we have to continue to work through before we can do that. And so again, at the request of our, of our Kurdish counterparts, we're deciding to focus right now on that. We have a heart for young women, but guess what? We don't get to define it. The stakeholders have to define it. And, the, and because we haven't been able to yet come around for these safety measures, we have to do it, we have to do it this way. Now, our solution, we took it one farther. We developed an entrepreneurship engineering course because we want to give them skills that, that they can use in any realm of the world. Okay, entrepreneurship skills are a little bit more theoretical. Engineering skills are tangible. And so Beth is an engineer. I do entrepreneurship. So we combine them and we, I'm not going to read this because I'm running out of time. Okay, if you want to try it. <laughs> Although Michael said I could have some of his time. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so if you want to try it, we hit a lot of walls, we made a lot of mistakes. We're hoping you do not have to make the same mistakes we did. If you want to try it, don't be scared. We started with the Stevens Initiative, with IREX. That was an absolutely wonderful place for us to start. They are a fantastic organization. They are organized, they're supportive, they're absolutely wonderful. You can do whatever you want. You can partner with a high school. You can partner with a local college, an out-of-state college, a university, somebody out of the country. You can partner with, God forbid, 
a different department on your campus. I know, I know, I know. Going international is one thing. Partnering with the engineering department? What the heck? We don't do that. We're siloed, right? You can partner with anybody. You can partner with your community. The thing is, you have to be able to define your why. We did not have our why defined at the beginning. We just jumped in and just wung it. We just, let's see what happens, right? Over the last few years, we have really worked to define our why. We've done that. Our motivation was primarily retention. How do we retain our students? During COVID, how do we retain them? That's, that was our initial motivation. The impact that we came up with came much later. We ended up creating a logic model for all you nerds out there, right? For all you nerds, you can enjoy this. Everybody else is like, that's boring. We had to really, really define our why. For us, our why became to develop social entrepreneurs who assume responsibility to be innovative change agents towards solutions that support people, pursue empathy, facilitate cultural awareness, protect the environment, and produce profits. This became every decision we made revolved around this. And so we had to define, okay, we're going to do it through an international exchange, the outcomes that we wanted. Again, we love to do a lot of things. We have a lot of ideas. If it doesn't meet one of these categories now, we have to let it go. And so we really had to narrow down our stuff. For us, advancing cultural awareness, fostering global collaborative engagement, promote, promote innovative critical thinking, address wicked problems. Our students don't have to go for wicked problems. Those are like unsolvable problems, right? You don't, they're, they're big problems like climate change. But we don't want them to shy away from big problems. And so we wanted to put that in there as things that they could look for. And our, our impact is we wanted to create a network and scalable innovation specifically between us and Iraq that we could continue to grow. So if you want to do it, give yourself time and expect numerous iterations. If you're not iterating, I'm going to assume you're not thinking about it, truthfully. Like, expect a number of iterations. Who do you partner with? you got to figure out what you want to do, right? For Beth and I, we found a foundation with the UN Sustainability Goals. We found a partnership between entrepreneurship and engineering. For us, those skills were wedded in a way that we felt like it really benefited our students. What are your strengths? Like, like, like Fran said, right? Like, what are you, the assets that you have? What assets can you pull in? I did one semester with just business students. We were very boring. <laughs> I will never do just one department again. Like, I thought we were cool. We're not. All right, cultural considerations. Cultural pieces to consider. Things we did not consider. What is their history? It wasn't till the third meeting, I'm embarrassed to say this publicly, it wasn't until the third meeting that we realized that there is an, a very important and distinct difference between Kurdish Iraq and Iraq. Now, we always do pre-meetings with our students where we go over history. At that time, we're like Googling stuff, like what? <laughs> like during the meeting live, like oh my gosh, we missed something really important. What is their history, okay? If, even if you're doing this in the States, who has access to what technology? Don't make assumptions, okay? Who, who has what? What does respect look like and what is considered rude? You don't know what you don't know. That's just the reality of it, right? But if you work to create an environment where conversations can happen, then if something happens where you're like, oh, yeah, uh, we don't do that for these reasons, like, you can, you can do that and be like, oh, yeah, sorry, okay, like, we'll move on, right? What is your platform for communication, time zones, even in the states this matters, and no slang? No slang, no slang. You have generational slang, you have regional slang, you have ethnic slang. If you use slang, you will literally spend the entire meeting defining words. Don't do it, it's, it works against you. All right, takeaway. Our barriers are of our own creation. COVID really showed me that all the things I didn't think I could do were barriers that I had imposed upon myself. They weren't actually barriers. They were things I thought were, but they weren't actually. And the other thing, staying with the, staying with the status quo, quo really means missed opportunities. And so depending on where you're at, you don't want to really miss some opportunities. OK, I want to thank our Stanford Global Studies. I really want to thank Kristen. You've been fantastic. It's felt seamless with you. You're amazing. Beth, my partner in crime, Portable College for supporting us. And definitely Jonas and Gary. Thank you so very much. applications until June 4th for the fall semester, so maybe we'll hand out these slides or just Google it. Okay. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Juliana, Michelle, and Elisa. I'm just blown away by your presentations. Uh, so let's open things up for questions. Hi. 
It's on? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, first of all, you guys are just, just an, amazing, an amazing job. We're just sitting here, you know, five years ago when we were in the fellowship, I feel like we were playing with sticks in the woods, <laughs> trying to figure out how to start a fire. And here you are taking us into a, like a space, you know, universe. Um, amazing job, everyone. Um, couple, two things I wanted to mention. So um, the last speaker, you know, just amazing. When you said you can do whatever you want, like you spoke to my soul, <laughs> but I also cried at the yes. same time, you know, with crocodile tears because I'm think I feel like a Cinderella on my campus, right? Like first you need to teach your five classes. Then you need to sit on all of these committees and participate in Shard Guardian and be on task force for all these initiatives that we're doing. And then if you have a moment, you know, like nine o'clock, you're like, ha, 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 just starting my day. Um, you know, do all that. So I feel like, how do we find, like, do you have any tips on how do we find more, t more hours in a day? Or like opportunities to tell somebody on your campus, like, I need, Re release time, reassign time. I like there is stuff I want to do. Yeah. Give me that time, you know, and compensate me for it, and take away this other stuff, these classes, you know, that I don't need to teach to do all these beautiful projects. So if anybody has tips, please yeah. talk to me. Um, that's my first question, and then my second question, just observing everybody's presentations. Um, I teach ESL, so language matters, and I'm just thinking like when you were all presenting, I'm trying to think of like all these buzzwords that we have right now, like in, at my college, right? They're like we're all into social justice right now. So I'm sitting there going, um, okay, so internationalizing is not gonna fly on my, on my campus. Like, but if you call it decolonizing, yes, it's right up, you know, what we're doing right now. Or if you say, um, you know, something with um, cultural, um, global citizenship. No, 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 no. We need to be culturally relative teaching and learning. Like if we call it that, then my administration will be like understanding what I'm doing. Um, have you encountered that trying to sort of like uh, sell it to your administration or like maybe even um, like, like thinking about how do you name things and what do you call them to be in trend, but also not compromise sort of what you think you should be doing. So that's kind of a so second question. So yeah. I'm sorry, it's a lot. So in <laughs> terms of more time, I don't know where that comes from. <laughs> I don't know where we get that. Um, but I actually think our barrier is less time and more fear, is we want things to be, to be started already put together. And so if there's something you want to do, you just have to do it. And you just have to acknowledge that it's not going to be perfect, right? Like you just got, you just have to do it. And I will say, one of the things I'm, I'm so appreciative for our administration is they pay Beth and I both for this class. Now, in the community college system, this is a BSAD class. It's a business class, right? She's not qualified to teach business classes, but yeah, but I'm calling yeah, Beth. But but they pay her. The same, the same way they pay me, but they do a special comp for her just so we can co-teach this class, just so we can try it, right? So like they're open to us. Now we haven't asked for release time, right? But they're like, yeah, we'll pay you to work more. Sure, go ahead, right? Like, although I guess they, they probably would give us release time. But, but in, in reality, like when, anytime you want to try something new, it's going to pull from what little time you already have. And it's going to pull a lot because you don't know what you're doing. And so you just have to be, that's why you really got to know your why, right? Like, does this matter enough to, take, to make that sacrifice? And if it doesn't, it's okay to say it doesn't, right? But if it does, like, then you do it, then you do it moving forward knowing, like, this is going to be that period of my life. That doesn't help you, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> And I'll share a little bit as well. One of the things that um, I always try to do with new projects and, and so on is to incorporate them in my existing work, if that makes sense, which doesn't mean that it takes less time or energy or any of those things, but at least it um, kind of fulfills the, the goals that I'm already doing and then scale them. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I do have a comment about decolonizing and, and you choosing that word. And um, one of my other roles at Sierra College is I'm our distance learning coordinator. And I um, also, in that role and in my instructional um, role, I have done a lot of work with um, equity and, and incorporating equity and equitized learning environments and all of that into classrooms. And we have had a pushback 
primarily from white faculty again, with the term equity, right? And I don't know if anyone else has experienced that. So what I have chosen to call it, um, based on the work of my dear friend, Dr. Um, Michelle Bakansky brock who has coined the term humanizing online teaching and learning, is I call it humanizing. And so same thing with, with decolonizing. I, I ran it by a bunch of folks. Our, uh, we have a, a group called The Village that supports um, Emoja students, and I ran it by them, and I ran it by our Winodi program, um, which is our indigenous student support group, and that it was exactly that. The, the cool word, right? <laughs> Instead of, yeah, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would just add, for, for my course, I'm just adding them in, you know, I'm, I'm not asking permission, it's just happening. <laughs> but I think that one thing that I've seen that's helpful when I, I mean, even just within ourselves, um, giving examples, so I implementing it, like Michelle said, and then talking about it when you're talking to others and explaining how impactful it has been to students and having the students share as well in their surveys, you know, how impactful these projects were, I think that's also been really helpful in you know pleading the case it's like you don't have to say it it speaks for itself you know hi everyone <laughs> um, well first of all I've been working with the epic uh, program for four years I'm, I'm I'm amazed just at the quality of these presentations. You know, you're so inspiring to me. You know, mind, mind blowingly good session. Um, I have a question. I, I guess it goes to Julian, actually. You know, I, I wish I had taken your class, you know, back when I was a teen. You know, and I, I, I there's one topic when, when you showed the nine influential factors, you know. Um, there, there was one that I didn't that I didn't see there, but I wonder if you if it has come up, you know, as you were conceptualizing the course, which is um, like basically mental health. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, this is a very personal question. I deal with somebody who has a compulsion problem that has affected, you know, spending habits, mm -hmm. and and I grew up with that. You know, but when you're a kid, you don't really know right. that's going on, right? So I was just curious if you. If, if you're addressing this somehow, and then what your ideas are on, you know, on this. Yeah. So every time, um, I don't know if it's on. Uh, every time I had a meeting with the Epic Fellows, somebody would have different suggestions, like politics was one of those. And it's really hard to pick nine, even, even those were hard to, to kind of narrow down. But my goal, I mean, I think that's a really great suggestion, and honestly, no one has mentioned it in our discussions, and I think that is a great one to add. Uh, I guess we'll make it 10. Um, <laughs> but nice yeah, no, and, and it's important because, um, you know, and, and it's, when, the thing about these is that they're all tied together. Like in some cultures, um, like in my, in my culture, I'm Mexican, you know, and my parents, my dad handles all the finances in my house. And that's just the way it's always been, right? So that's what I saw growing up. So they're all also interconnected. But my goal is to take each. So my I'm implementing this in my class right now that's starting in August. And my goal was to take that class and learn from it and sort of, you know, fine tune those nine or ten and try to make it better every semester. Because it's, it's never really been done in this way. And so my goal is to learn from it every semester and try to make it better, you know, every time. So, but I will definitely add it, consider it added. <laughs> I know Thomas has a question. Hold that one second, the microphone's coming. Thank you. Well, uh, just in response to uh, what we talked about, uh, you know, decolonization, equity, I, I think global studies is actually mm -hmm. the, the yeah. best descri description, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but my question is uh, for all three of you, maybe more to uh, Juliana. Uh, so your course, I think, is, is the one course that every student needs to take <laughs> right, <laughs> in college. Uh, but obviously, I'm not an you know, artificial, uh, articulate officer and uh, you know, I'm not involved in the IJET, you know, all these articulation courses and so on. Uh, but what happens, you know, students, they, they don't care what they learn unless they know the skill that they learn is going to help them, right? So uh, how can you start something, kind of a move, movement, so that 
whatever, the academic senate, the state you know, senates, and the uh, legislatures, they know the importance of these courses. For, for my topic in particular, I feel like there is a shift and you know, at my college, it's it's kind of sad because it, it takes someone to drive the curriculum to get it on, you know, the schedule. And for me, this is only my second semester teaching that class because it's new. And I think that, um, you know, having programs like Mind Over Money, having awareness, you know, com conversations around and being honest about the fact that it's not prioritized and it's one of the most important things that impacts our long-term happiness, health, financial, you know, everything. And so for me, um, I hope to, you know, I'm obviously here today sharing my, my work, but also I hope to highlight stories and, you know, within the course and, and as the course progresses. And I, we were talking, Angela and I were talking before, um, you know, the, the sessions and we were talking about continuing the collaboration after the program. And I'm really excited about doing work with her and continuing to advocate because it, it, it's really, sadly up to us and I mean I know the administrators are also here listening and and I think um, you know hopefully you know we can all take it back to our colleges and implement it in different ways and I think showing the value is is where it's at you know showing people what how this can change a student's life so I don't know yeah. mm -hmm. um, I would agree absolutely and um, one of the things that I always try to remember and when I'm advocating for students is you know we in instructional faculty or and and non-instructional faculty too I mean, we're with them all the time and we really are aware of their needs like and it's it's um and then also what's missing i can't remember who said that but what's missing after we do it for a long time and i just think advocating and just chipping away and just keep telling the story don't get tired just keep doing it until you know you achieve the goals that you want to to meet the students needs and to support their success so i just you know persistence I would also add allowing the students to advocate for themselves. Yes. So when Beth and I did our first class, we had our students present to our executive leadership team at the college, and we just just gave them the floor. Like, tell the admin team about what you did, right? And just like mostly as a thank you for them allowing us to try it. But after it was over, our executive leadership team was like, that was amazing. Students developed a hydro microelectric turbine to address power issues. I was like, I know, I never would have thought of it, right? Like allow students to be advocates for themselves because they're quite capable and people don't know what they don't know. Like, so instead of us being the squeaky wheel by ourselves, allow students to squeak along with you. Well, speaking of amazing, every single one of your presentations has uh, just been fantastic and Beyond the individual presentations, it's just been such a such an honor to see how well you collaborated with each other, and just to be able to witness this journey that you guys have been on together, and even collaborating with other people uh, at Stanford. And I hope that uh, um, I hope that that sense of collaboration will continue, not just among you six, but you know, with everyone here, and that it can. Uh, it can really you know, lead to further collaboration and, um, and it's just been such a pleasure for me and I know Gary as well to work with you. So um, thank you Mark and Amy and Fran and Juliana and uh, Michelle and like Elisa. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one last round of applause for... Uh,